Welcome everybody. Welcome to Earth Day Every Day, the, um, the group the group edition. Um, I'm Michelle Backus with Rutgers Cooperative Extension. I'm with Middlesex and, and Union County. And um, I'm going to be hosting this evening. Uh, I know a lot of you have been with us before, but for those of you, who this is your, your first time with us, first of all, welcome. Uh, just gonna give a quick overview of Rutgers Cooperative Extension. Rutgers Cooperative Extension is the outreach arm of Rutgers University. Um, we are, uh, we help fulfill the, the land grant mission um, that we are tasked with. Our job is to extend the resources up to the university into the counties that we, we serve. And um, we're a county-based system. Uh, it's, a, it's a partnership between the counties and the, the university. So every county in the state has a Rutgers Cooperative Extension office. And you can go and reach out to your local local county cooperative extension office, and they will help you solve your your problems. Um, so uh, the purpose of this particular webinar series is that we are helping people to figure out how to solve environmental problems. And uh, um, Earth Day Every Day was started right at the beginning of COVID when we were all at home. And we wanted to encourage people to think about what they could be doing at home to help protect the environment. And now, you know, as things has, have opened up a little bit now, now we're encouraging people to think about what they can do at home to protect the environment and also in their community. Uh, so tonight we're going to be using Zoom uh, as usual. And you can reach out to us through the chat, which is on the bottom right. We will get your message, although you won't be able to see other folks' uh, messages, but we will help relay the information to you. Um, we're also going to have a poll at the end. So maybe about 10 minutes before we end, we will open up a poll. If you could please make sure to answer those questions. Also, these sessions are free to the public, but we always you know, ask if, if you would consider making a donation to help support our program. Any amount is appreciated, and we will make sure to put the link for donations into the, the chat box, and the funding helps support the Rutgers Environmental Stewards Program, including internships, scholarships, and su supplies. Okay, so if you want to go on to the consent slide. So this slide with a lot of text on it is to let you know that you're all part of uh, the Rutger Rutgers University now considers you to be research subjects. Um, and we ask for your consent to take part in this research project. And basically what that means is that in a few months, in maybe six months, we'll reach back out to you to find out the impact that this program has made on your life. And we'll send you a survey just asking you to answer some questions, but we have to get your permission to do that. So when you take the poll, if you could indicate whether or not it's okay for that you consent to take part in this research project. Okay, so next slide. And then this slide here is just to let you know that Rutgers is an equal opportunity program provide, provider and employer. And if you have any questions about that, you can contact our uh, state extension director's um, office. All right, so I wanted to introduce our, our speakers tonight. We, um, so, so we are presenting tonight on citizen science. Um, no matter what we, we advertise it as citizen science, we know that there's lots of different terms for it, community science, civic science, volunteer science, there's lots of different terms for it. But we are all kind of collaborating on this. The, the Earth Day Everyday team is collaborating on this presentation. So you're, gonna, you're going to hear from all of us this evening. Um, so you'll hear from Amy Rowe, who's the county agent in Essex and Passaic counties. Her contact information is there. You'll hear from me. I'm with Middlesex and Union County. Sal Mangiafico is with Salem and Cumberland counties. And then Steve Yurjo is with Atlantic and Ocean counties. And we all basically have the same job in different parts of, of the state. Um, we are county agents, mostly dealing with natural resource environmental protection within the counties that, that we serve. So we're going to be talking to you tonight about, uh, we'll start out talking to you generally about what civic volunteer citizen science is. And then um, we will go into some of the Rutgers projects that are going on that you we encourage you to take part in. And then we'll talk about the New Jersey specific projects 
and then we'll just talk about some projects of note that you may be that you may be interested in getting involved with. And with that, I will turn it over to Sal to start us off. Hello, everyone. So just quickly, I'm going to go over uh, what citizen science is and what some of the advantages are to those who participate in citizen science, either from the volunteer end or from the scientist end. I'm just going to read this. This is the definition that uh, Natural Geographic has in their resource library. I'm just going to read it. Citizen science is a practice of public participation and collaboration in scientific research to increase scientific knowledge. Through citizen science, people share and contribute to data monitoring and collection programs. As Michelle mentioned, there's uh, various terms for this idea. Citizen science, community science, volunteer science, civic science. Um, at the core, it is public participation and collaboration in scientific research. Um, so it may involve volunteer data collection. Um, that could be something like going out and measuring the rainfall amounts, say, at your house or at your business, or doing some kind of water quality, water quality monitoring um, in a local stream or lake. Um, and sometimes it involves a little more um, analysis or interpretation. Uh, for example, there's some projects where people might look at aerial photographs to assess things like flood damage and so on. Organizations could be coordinators or, or uh, intermediaries. And so, um, so in other words, you know, you might be part of a watershed organization and that watershed organization may work with a scientist at a university in order to help coordinate volunteer efforts for that science project. Volunteers can be basically of any range, of any background, any age range, any background. Um, so there's some, some projects may be appropriate for children. Others um, may be more appropriate for those who have some specific knowledge. Um, so for example, if you are identifying insects, you may need some background in, in that identification skill. Certainly uh, technology that we have now available to us easily, things like uh, apps for our mobile phones or web forms we might use on a computer can help a lot in this endeavor. Um, they make access easier. Um, so for example, instead of filling out a lot of data sheets on paper and say mailing them in or, you know, I don't know, faxing them in, um, we can simply transmit data over the internet with an app or with a web form. It helps to keep um, answers uniform, right? You fill out what's on the, what's on the form. And um, so the data is kind of uniform in the way it's sent. Also, um, since most of our phones are enabled with GPS to give our location, for certain things that can be real helpful um, to identify precisely where the person is who's collecting the data. And there's the potential to use smart sensors on, on our mobile phones. Um, it could measure things like temperature or other environmental variables um, that could be used to kind of um, collect a lot of um, data precisely that could be transmitted back to the scientist. Some of the um, goals and advantages of citizen science um, for the volunteers, um, some of the benefits are education of volunteers about the scientific process and about um, scientific methods and about what's going on um, and what data is being collected around them. It also helps to connect people of similar interests, um, you know, that can get together and, and do these types of projects. It also helps connect people with their physical, biological, social environments, right? So it, it gets people invested in, for example, looking at the water quality in a local lake or, um, identifying what say birds or insects may be coming to their own yards or their own you know, park in their neighborhood. And it helps to empower and build existing organizations. So that is if a, uh, a watershed organization helps to coordinate volunteers to participate in citizen science, you know, it helps to build and empower that organization. On the scientists end, um, this is a way to collect a lot of data um, with lower cost, um, instead of, you know, paying graduate students or paying employees to go out and collect data, you have volunteers doing it. It can be a leveraging of the expertise of skilled amateurs, 
right? So of course, in our communities, we have people who are quite skilled in um, being birders, naturalists, who are interested in the weather, who are sort of amateur uh, astronomers, um, who are good at insect identification. Um, so, so leveraging those, the skills of those people out in our community and putting their skills to good use. And it can just, and it can increase the geographic scope or if I use the phrase temporal intensity. Um, that is, you know, widening the geographic scope of data collection or getting more data uh, more often, um, simply because you have more people out in the field collecting this data um, and it may be convenient for them to do so, right? If someone just needs to go outside every morning and look at a rain gauge at their own home, um, that can be done daily and with, with little cost to the um, person doing it. I did, of course, have to include a slide on some potential drawbacks. Um, basically, I guess these are all from the, the scientist's point of view. Um, but there is, of course, the need to train, organize, manage volunteers, um, which if you're starting with, say, you know, an employee or a graduate student, um, they may have they may have the requisite training. And because they're, say, working for you, um, they're easier to organize and manage. There may be some difficulties in consistency of observations, um, simply because if you have different people um, doing doing observations in different locations, their own um, biases, if you will, on how they view things may come into play. Um, even something that you think is being measured precisely, like say rain in a in a rain gauge, one person may kind of consistently read higher, one person may kind of consistently re read lower. And if they're always in the same location, then that introduces a little bias in there. Um, and of course, um, since people may not be being paid for their work, um, there may be cases in which they are a little less reliable, certainly in, in things where there's adverse weather um, or other conditions like that. And there is the, the possibility of um, variations in the knowledge of volunteers. So if there is a project, say, identifying birds or insects or plants where some knowledge is necessary, um, some variability in, that, in those skills among the volunteers may affect the results. OK, so very quickly, I'm just going to go over a few sources um, that, that are catalogs of citizen science projects. Um, so these are ones that anyone can access. First is the. U.S. Environmental Protection Agency Citizen Science website. Um, so that's citizenscience.gov. And then in this case, slash catalog to get to the, the catalog of projects. So it does mention there um, that the projects listed in, this, in the catalog are validated by federal employees. Um, so these are projects that in, in some sense have at least been um, uh, vetted at least to some degree. Um, by the EPA or by another federal agency working with them. Um, this is a great resource. Uh, you can download the number, you can download the whole database of projects if you want to search through it, or you can go through kind of the tiles and see which things appeal to you. Um, it's kind of nicely set up where the status is active, recruiting volunteers or not recruiting, recruiting volunteers. Um, and then giving you some sense of the geographic scope. So it's pretty easy to look through there quickly, see what appeals to you, see where they are, and if they're recru recruiting volunteers. Another resource is the Rutgers University Libraries, has a, has a site on, um, or has a page on citizen science. Um, so here too, there's some links to other types of resources, including way down at the bottom of the screen is SciStarter, which is the next database I'm going to speak about. And there's this website, uh, scistarter.org. And I think uh, we all giving this presentation tonight, um, I'll kind of like the way this one's set up, simply because it's it's got a good search engine built into it. Um, so you can see right on the front page here, you can start by searching by keyword or by topic. And if you were to drill down, um, to the search, the search engine. There are a few options there where you can search by keyword, location. Um, an interesting option is projects to do while, for example, on lunch, at school, at night. Um, 
There's a list of topics and then also uh, breaking down projects by age. So let's see. So the evening's going rather quickly. I was gonna jump right on the site and kind of do a search for you, but I think I'm gonna skip that for now. Um, so I'd kind of set up some, some searches to, to do, but so for example, looking at where I live, using the keyword water quality, um, something that can be done in oceans, streams, and, river, and rivers, um, something came up, Bloom Watch. And that's basically where people go out and look at um, water bodies to see if there are harmful algae blooms. So there's some training um, so people can learn what to look for for harmful algae blooms and then a way to report back uh, what they're seeing. Right. So again, a, a great way to have, you know, people are out all the time at their, at their local lakes. This way you can um, give them a chance to put their observations to work and report back the potential for a harmful algae bloom. I also thought what was interesting is there are um, online options there. Um, so you can, you can select just only projects that you can do online. Um, so if you're not someone who, who's able to get out, um, there are still things you can do um, at home online. So some of those that are doing the search, some of them that were listed as online are actually kind of hands-on top, uh, hands-on projects that have some online components. Um, but for example, I just selected a couple here. One is called Ida Damage Lookout. And basically this has volunteers evaluate aerial photographs to assess uh, damage from Hurricane Ida. Right, so the photographs come to you, you assess it, see if it looks like there's you know, flooding damage and so on. Or um, a woodpecker cavity cam. Um, so you're, you can stay home and look at the um, webcam of um, some woodpecker cavities and study the interactions and then report back um, your observations. All right, I'm going to turn it over there. A uh, good place for questions is to pop, pop, pop them in the chat box and, and we'll get to them. Hey, thanks, Sal, for that very nice introduction. I uh, didn't really see any questions yet. Did anyone else get any questions? No, not yet. Okay. If folks have questions, they can go ahead and put them in the chat box. OK. So we are going to dive right into Rutgers Citizen Science Project, because obviously we would love it if you would volunteer to do uh, citizen science for our New Jersey-based projects. And one of the one of the most involved ones that we have in terms of numbers is called Coco Ross. I don't know if you guys have already heard of this. Um, next slide, Sal. There we go. Uh, so, so Coco Ross is the Community Collaborative Rain, Hail, and Snow Network. And this is actually a nationwide program, but there is a New Jersey chapter or division um, where you can submit. And our state climatologist, David Robinson, is He's very involved in this and he's an amazing resource for, for everyone in New Jersey. Um, but basically, you can see here some of the some of the data that's collected and some of the some of the things that are happening across the state. Um, but this is, as Sal had mentioned before, he was alluding to this project when he was talking about rain gauges. Um, this is a precipitation monitoring network. And you can do this from your backyard. It's fairly straightforward. Go ahead, next slide, please. <clears throat> so basically, all you need to measure your precipitation is a rain gauge, which can either be purchased uh, or um, you can use all sorts of things uh, or and a ruler to measure snow. And then you report your findings right at your location using a computer or a smartphone. There is an app for this uh, particular program. 
You just need to, to report your precipitation. There is an, a training requirement, so you have to definitely be uh, able to do that. It, it is delivered online at the moment. There, there used to be in-person training available, but again, with COVID, we are, we're all online. Uh, but this is a project that, like I said, it's not just New Jersey, it is across the whole country. And this data has been used by all types of, of folks. The USDA is using this data. Lots of scientists across the country are using this amazing network to, to look at weather trends and to look at all kinds of um, all kinds of things that are happening. And so this is a really cool um, project that you just need to sign up. Here is the, the website. And again, this is the New Jersey chapter, but this is a state a nationwide program. And so there are thousands of people reporting on this. And uh, this picture down here is our very own Angela from Middlesex County. Uh, she works, she's the master gardener coordinator there. She was very excited to to have her rain gauge and the Middlesex County office was was a Coco Ross station and they were reporting. So, so if you are interested in, in weather and being able to do citizen science from your home, you might want to consider this project. Now I'll hand it over to Michelle, I think. Yep. Thanks, Amy. I'm going to talk to you guys about a uh, uh, projects that's been going on for a few new years uh, now. It was started in 2014 by a professor in the plant science department, Dr. Lena Struve, um, and her students. It's called the Personal Bio Blitz. Um, if you're not familiar with bio blitzes, they typically happen at a particular location, like a, um, you know, a, a passive recreation park, a, a forest, a, a wetland. Um, and what happens is there's just a blitz of, of activity for about a day. Sometimes it can be 24 hours. People will stay overnight and they are working to document all of the biodiversity in that particular location. Well, Lena and her students kind of changed things up and they created what's called a personal bio blitz that you all can participate in. The goal is to discover, identify and list as many wild species as possible in the world from March 1st to May 15th from any species group at any place, in any time, anywhere on earth. <laughs> so you don't have to be at a particular location. You could be in your house and you could see an insect under the sink and you can participate in the bio blitz and document um, that species that way. The, the, it uses an, an app and a, um, a program called iNaturalist, which some of you may have, have heard of. You may already have the app on, on your phone, but that's a great website if you haven't looked at it already, iNaturalist.org. Um, so, so that is how they, the, uh, folks document the species as part of the personal bio blitz. They use that, that app on their, on their phone. So why did they do this? Why did they create a personal bio blitz? You could just go back one, one step to that one slide, Sal. Um, essentially what they were, they were looking to do was they were, wanted to encourage people to explore the world around them, specifically the species around them. Knowledge about species around us in everyday life has decreased in the last few decades. So our naturalist school, as a society, our naturalist skills has, has greatly reduced. It used to be that people did not, were not, were not blind to the species around them. So for example, um, I, my background is in, is in botany and, and, and uh, plants, and we call this term plant blindness, when essentially you look at a forest and all you see is, is green and you don't necessarily know an oak from, from a maple. Um, so organismal blindness is, is rap, rampant now in, in society. And the idea was to take these 75 days to really study organisms at, at the species level and help train yourself to, to, to be aware of the diversity of species around you in your everyday life. Could be in your backyard, could be in a park, could be anywhere. This is the website here, herbarium.rutgers.edu forward slash personal bio blitz. 
Okay, you can go to the next one. So this is just a little bit more on the, um, the program here. So this is not something going on right now, but starting March 1st of 2022, you will be again, be able to participate if you, if you like. And what you do, have to do is you have to download the iNaturalist app on your phone. Um, so it works on uh, um, um, all different types of, of smartphones. And uh, um, it also, there is a website, so you can use a tablet. You could also just use your, your computer, but you have to actually join the personal BioBlitz project when you download the, the app, download the app. And then there's uh, some place called projects on the app and you go in and you just put in personal BioBlitz. There's also a Facebook group and um, there's all these instructions about, we're not gonna go into a deep dive on how to use iNaturalist because that would take up this entire time but there's already really great instructions on this website for how to use iNaturalist. Okay, next, next slide. So this is the personal, every, every iNaturalist project has a website and you can go to the personal BioBlitz website on iNaturalist and see what has been done so far. So the first thing I want to point out here is look at the, the, the map. Uh, the map for the personal BioBlitz, there has been observations made all around the globe as part of the Rector's Personal BioBlitz. Total of close, close to 70,000 observations have been made as part of the Personal BioBlitz. Um, close to 9,000 species have been documented by about 115 people. So this is what your data would be going into this, into this uh, website. Okay, so next slide. Okay, and so then I'll go on to talk to you about one of um, an iNaturalist project that, that I had started in the spring. Um, it's called the Rain Gardens of Union County Project. And what we have been doing in Union County is in Union County, we have a lot of rain gardens. We have over 30 rain gardens. And a rain garden, if you, if you don't already know, is it's a stormwater management feature um, so essentially it's, it looks like a garden when you look at it, but actually what it's doing, it's like a sponge sitting in the landscape, uh, that is planted with native, uh, flowering plants made to look beautiful, but it's, uh, when, when it, it accepts runoff and infiltrates runoff from a roof, for example, it could also be a driveway, any sort of hard surface, any sort of impervious cover, you can direct the stormwater runoff or the rainwater runoff into the rain garden. So rain gardens are incredibly popular. We have them all over the state. They do a great job at soaking up rainwater runoff um, and improving water quality in the watershed. But we wanted to know in Union County is what is living in our rain gardens? What live and visits? What 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 lives and visits our rain gardens? Uh, we know that there's lots of pollinators, lots of butterflies, lots of insects, other small organisms living there. But we needed help figuring out what, what it's supporting. So anyone can participate in this project. It's going on right now. It's year round. Um, this is the, the website here, njas.rectors.edu forward slash rain dash garden dash biodiversity. Um, you can go to the next slide. And then what you would do is also, it's an iNaturalist project. So you would download, first you would download that iNaturalist app. Um, we do have a map showing you where all the rain gardens are in Union County, and that's on that website. It's a Google map. You can just click on the site and we'll, it will give you directions for driving to the individual rain gardens. Okay, next slide. So once you are there, you can start making your observations with your, with your iPhone. Um, you could even just use a camera and then you can, when you get back home and you have a computer, you can upload your pictures to uh, iNaturalist that way. But typically people use a smartphone, just like um, this woman is here. She's taking a picture of a butterfly that's on this plant. And you can go to the next side. And then maybe you're going to see things like uh, birds. Um, we've seen uh, bees and we've also seen crickets, all sorts of different, all sorts of uh, different grasshoppers, birds, and these are the kinds of species that we want to know about what's living in our rain gardens. So you can go, you can join that at, at any time throughout the year. Spring is a great time to do it. Spring and summer is a great time to do it. Great project to do with scouts or your kids, family friendly, 
um, anybody can join. Okay, go ahead. Um, oh, I just wanted to make one note here that when you, this is um, sometimes people are a little confused about how to join a project. Uh, when you go into iNaturalist, uh, you go into um, on the bottom right there where it has a little briefcase, that's the projects icon. You go there and then you can just search up your project. And then when you record your observation, you just have to make sure that you enable the project that you want the information to go to. Okay, next slide. Okay, and I'm gonna turn it over to Steve, talk to you about water. Thanks so much, Michelle. So, so far we've talked to you guys about what citizen science is and also, you know, some projects that are, you know, done by Rutgers. Um, I'm going to talk to you guys about some New Jersey based projects that aren't done by Rutgers, but by other organizations that we've partnered with or we work with. But because the four of us are all intimately involved in water and water quality issues, I'm going to kind of highlight water quality monitoring programs and watershed monitoring programs because the biggest question we tend to get from all the people that we do programs for, especially if we're talking about water issues, is they want to know how's the water, you know, the water in X lake, in the bay, in what stream, what creek. So that's a really big question that we try to answer, but it's difficult to do without a lot of information. And one of the great things about doing water quality monitoring is um, there's a wide variety of habitats you can go monitor, whether it's a lake, a pond, the beach, um, it can be a shoreline or a bay. Next slide, please. But in addition to the different habitats you can go out and monitor, there's a variety of different um, parameters you, you can measure and you can go out and collect and tie it into your interests of uh, what you're interested in water quality. Say you're interested in sport fishing, there's fish tagging programs. And by tagging the fish, we can see where they go, whether or not there's food for them to survive, which ties into water quality. Maybe you're interested in problems that you see, you know, if you see foaming water, or if you see an algal bloom, like Sal mentioned previously, you might be interested in helping to combat that, but also seeing how much is actually <clears throat> occurring and what's causing it to, to happen or you're interested in just the wildlife that's out there. So there is a picture on the bottom of a uh, mosquito larvae, um, the biology and the insects that live in streams and rivers and lakes actually can tell us about the water quality. So you don't have to have a strong chemistry background, um, but if you are interested in say insects or even um, uh, fish, or even if you're just interested in the, the abundance of food that we get from our waterways, like the seafood in the top picture there. Um, but all of us actually, you know, need water to survive. We do drink it. There are some groundwater and drinking water monitoring programs that are out there as well. So there are a variety of different programs that are available to tie into whatever your interest is, is in. And as we have mentioned a couple of times, they are tied into possible activities that you do already. So if you're out hiking, you can actually just take a look at a stream, you know, tie into the iNaturalist app. Uh, app you know, put in your observation and continue along your hike in a park. So this isn't something that necessarily has to be a, a huge burden or an additional effort on your part. You can tie it into your activities and that um, databases that we've shown you so far can help tie in your interest, your activity level and, and what you wanna do to actually help protect the environment, whether it be water or plants, et cetera. So next slide, please. So the Watershed Institute, um, is an organization that has put together um, a resource list. They've got a page that includes a map and links to watershed groups throughout New Jersey. So if you wanna find an organization near your, near your home that you wanna actually help um, monitor water quality on, they, this map will help you uh, find that. Um, because water issues generally tend to be pretty local, obviously, you know, you have a certain stream, a certain lake, a certain, you know, bay, um, a lot of it will be tied into local, um, your local availability. So there might not be something that's in your uh, close vicinity, but there might be something nearby or in the watershed that you live in that you can help to protect. So if you have that interest and you wanna move forward with getting any sort of um, water sampling done, there's all different variety of things you can test for, a lot, a lot of different um, areas you can test in. So you can match that interest with whatever you happen to have. So next slide, please. Um, but I also wanted to, to, to make you guys aware that if water's not your thing, it is our thing, because that's what we're involved with, but if water's not your thing, there are other ways, uh, uh, other state 
uh, programs that you can get involved with, other projects you can get involved with. So on the left here, we have the Invasive Strike Force, which is the New York, New Jersey um, trail system. It trains volunteers to go out and identify invasive plants and natural habitats to see what's taking over. They also organize teams to go out and actually remove those invasives if they see enough of it or if they document it you know, for, for, for a long enough period of time. Um, the middle picture is a picture from the State Department of Environmental Protection. Um, they do a um, illegal dumping watch. Um, if you're out hiking in a park and you happen to see piles of um, trash that have been illegally dumped, um, there's a way for you to actually scan out from your smartphone, take a picture of the site and upload it to um, the DEP so you can actually report that as well. And then all the way on the right is the New Jersey Forest Service. Um, if you want to go out and actually start measuring trees, if trees are your thing, um, they do um, habitat mapping of certain tree species. So you can actually help um, improve or decrease your, your, your tree blindness, as Michelle was mentioning before, by actually getting out there and seeing the forest from the trees and seeing what's making it up and helping to map those things. So next slide, please. But if water is your thing, next slide. Um, locally, um, I work with the Barney Bay Partnership we have a program called Paddle for the Edge. It uses um, canoeists, kayakers, and paddle boarders to actually monitor um, the coastline. So that's the edge that they're looking at. And obviously all those three types of um, watercraft use paddles, so hence Paddle for the Edge. Um, they look at the shoreline to see if there's any changes along any marshlands that's there, that are there, any changes in development along the edge of the water. So basically they train volunteers to go out into the bay, Barnegat Bay, and paddle along and, and fill out their observations. Um, next slide, please. So the way it works is it works primarily through a smartphone, because obviously you don't need to have a laptop sitting on your lap as you're out on a kayak. Um, they train the citizen scientists um, in, in a several different training sessions. Um, they train you to collect the information through a smartphone app, um, and they have a certain window of time that they have you guys go out and do the survey if you participate in this. They collect shoreline data, including um, the shape of the bank, um, vegetation height, if there's any, if there's any animals that are in there, um, if you see mussels or other shellfish growing along it, and they also ask you to include a photo as well. Then you take that information, you upload it to the, the app, then later on the scientists of the Barnaby Bay Partnership collect, um, calculate um, scores based upon how much the edge is eroding or not eroding or developed or not developed and staying natural, et cetera. So they're using this information to help guide, you know, habitat mapping, et cetera. But they do provide all the training for you guys on this, but it's a great way for people who are already out on the bay paddling around that they can actually help to protect the marsh system or the, the shoreline system as well. Next slide, please. So since Paddle for the Edge has been going since about 2015, they've done over 8,600 locations. Um, thanks to the 400 plus citizen scientists who have been involved with it, but that they've been able to cover during those years about 155 miles of shoreline. And this is all information that would not have been possible to collect without the help of volunteers and people acting as scientists in the eyes and the ears for the Barnegat Bay Partnership. So for, if anyone here has participated in that, thank you so much. But this is great information that we have. Next slide, please, that we can do a couple of different things with. So we can monitor living shorelines. Like I said, they take measurements of the, sh of the shellfish that are growing on the, the edge of the habitat, see if they're staying healthy, see if they're shrinking or growing, looking at those for potential restoration areas, and identify any sort of impaired or, or failing habitats with high erosion. Um, it enhances habitat mapping because we are taking photos and collecting information at the time. And also it helps people plan out for doing any sort of restoration project. So if there's an area that tends to be on the lower side where it's really eroding or it needs to be, get bolstered, we can use that as a site for restoration projects. But if you're interested in doing any sort of state, uh, statewide monitoring, there's a variety of different programs for the variety of different in interests that you have. And even if you're just interested in water, there's a whole variety of things that you can get involved with with there. And with that, I believe I'm passing it on to, to the next person, but thank you. And we've got Cornell Feeder Watch. I believe it's Michelle. Yes, yes. And we've had some questions to come in, so I'm just going to pause here uh, quickly for some questions. First of all, before, before I forget, I also wanted to mention, Steve mentioned um, the invasive species work, and I wanted to make sure to mention the New Jersey Invasive Species Strike Team, um, and they 
they do great work throughout throughout New Jersey coordinating the efforts all, all over New Jersey of invasive species eradication. Um, and uh, they also have an app. So when you are out, uh, you can be documenting what invasive species are out there on your favorite trails or your, your, your favorite parks. Um, other questions that came in. So there was, first of all, for these folks are asking if we can send a list with these projects. Uh, yes, we will, we will provide the presentation to everyone who's participated as a PDF. Um, and then the recording of this presentation will be on the Earth Day Everyday website. So you'll, you'll have this information. And also on the personal bio blitz, someone asked um, how to join the personal bio blitz. So when you go onto the iNaturalist app, um, on the lower right hand side, there's something that says projects. And when you click on projects, you can search. Now, um, I just did it. I just searched for the personal bio blitz and know that this year's personal bio blitz is over. It ended in May. So you may not be able to join it anymore. There's, there's personal bio blitz is for every year going back to 2014. So what you could do is you could go to the website, the Rutgers Personal Bio Blitz website, sign up for the project, and then they'll notify you when the project is open again in 2022. And at that point, you'll be able to join that, that particular uh, project. Okay, so, so moving on, um, if, you have, if you are a birder, have interest in, in birds, um, you definitely should be familiar with the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. They are a fantastic resource, for, fantastic educational resource for birds, birds con bird conservation, and they're a leader in bird biodiversity. And they have a number of civic volunteer science, community citizen science projects for you to get involved with. Um, I, very quickly, I wanna mention feederwatch.org. That's the website theaterwatch.org. And this is uh, a project you can do right at home. If you have a bird feeder, or if you just have, you know, plants that birds frequent in your backyard, you can join this project and use their protocol to help document the, the birds in your particular locale. So Project Feeder Watch turns your love of feeding birds into scientific discoveries. So that's what it says here. And the great thing about the uh, Cornell Lab of Ornithology is you do have to use their, your pro their protocol um, and you do have to be trained, but all of that is online and you basically go through a self-paced training. Um, there's also another great app that they have called Merlin, which when you're out, in the field somewhere, hiking, doing whatever, in a park, you can use that app to, uh, to help identify birds. So that's just something, feederwatch.org, that you can do at home. But I also, next slide, please, wanted to talk to you about um, NestWatch. Next slide. Um, NestWatch is also part of the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And, um, oh, thank you, whoever put up the poll. So the poll is now open if folks want to go ahead and answer the poll questions. So NestWatch is a very important uh, citizen science program. Oftentimes, I, this is a particular pet peeve of mine, so I wanted to bring this up uh, to you. Oftentimes, we have folks that come to us or come to our parks naturalists, and they want to, bird, they want to build bird boxes of all types and sizes bluebird boxes, kestrel boxes, um, wood, wood duck boxes. And this is all fantastic. This is all, this is all wonderful for nest cavity birds. But what sometimes happens, well, more often than not, what happens is um, those boxes will be built, they will be installed, and then they are just kind of left. They are not monitored or they're not maintained. And that's a problem because what will end up happening with those um, boxes is that they'll be invaded by invasive birds, uh, birds like the European starling or the um, how, or, uh, house spar sparrows will actually, actually outcompete nest cavity birds 
and they're known to destroy nests and eggs and kill nestlings of our, of our native birds. Uh, for example, the birds that you see on the bottom of the screen here, like the Eastern blue bird or the house wren, those are all small uh, nest cavity birds. And that's often what people are building bird boxes for. But if those boxes are not monitored and maintained on a regular basis, then they will, you know, very, very often be invaded by these and outcompeted by these invasive birds. So if this is something that interests you, if you are, if you frequent a park and you see that there are a lot of boxes, get in touch with whoever uh, manages the park. Maybe it's a town park or a county park and see if you can adopt those boxes. And what you would do is you would go through this Nest Watch protocol. You may have an online training. Um, you learn about nest and egg ID. Um, you take the online quiz to get certified. You find your nest and then you use their protocol to submit the data back to them. So you're providing this fabulous service where you're take caring, taking care of these already established boxes. So next slide. Uh, the next slide, I believe, is a picture. This is a uh, Sumini. Um, and also Joan Pannoni is on um, the uh, webinar tonight also. Both Joanne and um, Sue both uh, are, are um, have been monitoring, established and monitored bluebird uh, boxes. So the picture here, Sue is monitoring one of our boxes in Davidson Mill Pond Park but she also does the boxes at Thompson Park in Middlesex County. And uh, um, she's successfully you know, maintained boxes throughout the year. And she was able to show that based on the work that she did, um, they, her boxes did successfully you know, breed a, a, a clutch of, of, of bluebirds. And if it hadn't been for her, they probably would have been pushed out by these invasive birds. Um, so that's a great project to get involved with. There's also the New Jersey Bluebird Society, um, and they provide great resources if you're interested in, in, in that. Okay, next slide. Okay, and now I'm turning it back over to Amy to talk about monarch larva project. Okay, so thanks, Michelle, for that very in-depth look at bird monitoring projects. Uh, so now we're gonna switch gears to butterflies as many people are very concerned about the monarch and its plate as it is uh, starting to starting to dwindle and um, people know very much already about the struggles of monarchs. And so there is a citizen science project just for looking at the larvae of monarchs and um, reporting back on all stages of monarch larvae. So you are monitoring eggs in this project. You are inventorying milkweed. You are looking at caterpillars. You are seeing if the caterpillars make it to adults. Um, and so this project is specific to a certain site. You have to register a site, which could be your backyard, it could be a spot in a park. It has to be um, registered as part of the program. So it's not just you hiking and seeing a, a butterfly. This is something that's a little more, uh, more of a commitment. So if you're looking for something to, to do with your kids or with the scouts uh, for, for a summer project, this one is, is very good. This is part of the University of Wisconsin, also in partnership with the University of Minnesota. And so there are thousands of people that have been doing this. People do uh, get trained on this. There is a specific way to figure out how to, how to inventory the milkweed, make sure you're not counting the same plant as multiple milkweeds. It's, it's fairly involved compared to some of the other projects that we've been talking about. Um, but the, the data that's coming out of it is, is fairly sophisticated and is really helping researchers to understand temperature effects of, of monitoring, of, I mean, of, of monarch development and precipitation, uh, how precipitation also impacts these butterflies. And so there, there really is 
quite a lot of information that's gleaned uh, from this project. And if you don't want to be too involved, you can actually decide which parts of this project you would like to participate in. So if you just want to count eggs and be done for the season, you can do that. It's only as committed as you want to be, um, but the, the main commitment is that you're focusing on one single site. So um, there are really lots of, lots of ways to do this. Unfortunately, there is not an app, so you are going to have to count some things and um, you know maybe put it in notes on your phone or um, you know a piece of paper or something and then go back to your computer and report online. Um, so it's a little, a little tricky because you can't just report it out in the field. But again, this is, is something that is providing really great information for researchers and uh, is great for anyone that's interested in helping our monarchs and to understand what's happening locally and what's happening across the country. There are lots of maps available to show who is, who is reporting, what people are seeing. The data is really interesting to look at. You can see there's a little graph here um, that's showing all kinds of things. So this project is, is something for the butterfly lovers and uh, for people to, to get out there and really understand what's happening at the local level in terms of how many of the eggs that you see are making it to the caterpillar stage, then how many caterpillars are making it to the, pu the pupa, the cocoon stage, and then who's actually making it out of, out of the cocoon as an adult. And so it's, it's interesting uh, to, see, to see what's happening for sure. And again, this is, this is a, a project that anyone could do. You just need to make sure that you have a milkweed patch somewhere because this, this does require uh, that, you, that you have milkweed so that you do have, have monarchs and have caterpillars. So just keep that in mind. Uh, the website is monarchjointventure.com org and then MLMP Monarch Larva Monitoring Project. Next slide, please. Okay, so I just wanted to show you uh, here is what's been reported in New Jersey uh, just for, for since this has been up. I believe that the project started in 2000 um, and it's been in New Jersey, you can see all the sites, so it's not, it's not as populated as it could be. Uh, so they are looking for more, for more people to report in New Jersey and maybe you weren't aware of this project um, and it would be great to, to get more representation across, across the whole state. We, we know there's a lot more monarchs out there, um, but you can see the monitoring sites, 114 sites, 136 users, um, and then how many milkweed plants observed? 29,000. So that's just a summary of what people are reporting. We know there's a lot more out there. So it would be great if, if people could join this, this project, especially if you're interested in butterflies and, and caterpillars and uh, seeing all the life cycles. So, so consider this one. And um, yeah, you can be as involved as you want to be. <clears throat> like I said before, it's it's what you make of it and what you have the ability to do. So don't feel pressured. They are excited for any data that you could report because they're, they're really looking to fill in uh, New Jersey. So next slide and next presenter, go ahead. Okay, so, so that is all the, the projects. I, we, have a, we have a couple, couple more that we may, may make note of. But um, some some closing thoughts here, so I can go through this. Unless I know you wrote them. Sure. Okay. If so like. so community science is a great way to learn about the ecology in your in your community on any topic that interests you. Um, definitely visit the uh, websites that that Sal had had talked to about, to you about, especially the Sci Starter. A website that's a that's a great way to just kind of dabble and see what's going on. Start at home if you don't want it to be too overwhelming. Um, do something that's convenient for you because if it's not convenient for you, then you're just not going to to follow through with it. 
Um, you could certainly contact your local cooperative extension office to see what they have going on. Um, and they can direct you to projects that, that where they know that there is a need. And then you can also, you know, work with your organizations that you're already involved with to develop your own community science projects. Um, so with that, uh, we're, we're, uh, we welcome any questions in the chat box if you, if you have them. I also wanted to, um, if you have questions, go ahead and put them in the chat, but I did wanna make sure to mention one others that we have at, at Rutgers. Uh, in 2018, Dina Fonseca, who's um, a Rutgers professor, uh, did what's called a tick blitz. Um, and essentially what they were doing was to document uh, the different species of uh, ticks that are all over um, New Jersey, actually no, in four counties in New Jersey. Um, this is how they confirmed that um, the Northeast Asian ticks have been present in the garden state since at least 2013. Um, so this was purely a, a Rutgers researcher led project, but Dina wanted me to let this audience know that they are going to be transitioning that project over to be a citizen science project and they are looking for volunteers to help them. So I will make sure to put Dina's contact information into the, into the um, um, chat box. They are not up and running yet. Uh, she's just now kind of getting the project started, uh, but that's something that's coming up possibly for 22, 2022 if you wanna help do tick research in, in New Jersey. Okay. All right. So please go ahead and complete the poll if you haven't already done that. Um, I don't see a ton of questions. So I want to make sure to mention that next week starts kind of the second half of our, of our um, Earth Day Everyday series, which is Earth Day Everyday in the city. And so we'll be focusing on hyper urban issues. Uh, for our heavily developed areas in New Jersey. So things like CSOs, what are combined sewer overflows and, and why should you care? I'll be covering next week lead contamination in soil and specifically as it pertains to gardening in urban soils. Um, and there's some other really, really cool ones. We have Aaron Strutz from the Watershed Institute to come and talk about assault, another, a citizen science project that you all can get involved with in the winter. Um, that's going to be our, our last speaker. Uh, she's going to kick off that salt monitoring project that goes on throughout New Jersey. Um, so you can help monitor your streams for salt uh, levels, which is very, very important when they're putting down salts on, on the roadway. Okay, so I see a couple of questions coming in. Um, is there a study for the mar uh, marmalated stink bugs? Uh, so I, I don't know of a citizen science project for the marmalated stink bug. I know George Hamilton, our entomologist, he was the one who did the talk on spotted lanternfly uh, this, this fall with us. Um, he was doing uh, that research, but I don't know how much of that involved uh, volunteers. But what you could do is you go to that SciStarter website, put in the marmalated stink bug <laughs> and see what is available. Maybe, maybe there is some university um, in the United States who would love for your help to, to tell them what's going on in New Jersey with the marmalated stink bug. Um, okay, so a note that uh, when using the Merlin app, um, which is a great app if you're interested in, in birding and, and bird ID to just uh, make sure, make sure to not use the, make sure to not harass the birds with the bird calls on the Merlin app. Um, it's very tempting, I know, <laughs> but it's something that can, that can kind of cause them angst. Uh, for folks who are interested, there's a question about cocoa rods and getting involved in that one. That's another one that you just go online, um, make sure it's spelled correctly <laughs> because it kind of has a, a crazy spelling. Uh, but the thing about cocoa rods is you have to buy their rain gauge. You can't just use any rain gauge. They have a very specific very large rain gauge that you have to purchase. It's not that it's it's not that expensive. It's just that you 
everyone has to be using the same tool to monitor uh, precipitation. Uh, so thank you, Steve, for putting that, that website up. Uh, all of their trainings are online. You can do it at your own pace. They have a great training for, for rain, and then they have a whole separate training for snow. And then they give you guidance on where to install that rain gauge. You, you, you have to make sure that you install it in a kind of an open area where you will get appropriate readings. Um, so, so they give you guidance on, on, on that. They're also very communicative. Um, if you could take a picture and send it where you want to set, where you want to send up your set up your rain gauge, they will tell you if it's a good if it's a good place or not. Yeah. So I see a question about the the Monarch monitoring program. Mm -hmm. um, are they interested in people that raise monarchs indoors, inside in cages? So this particular project, the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project, is specifically for for wild caterpillars and wild butterflies outdoors. They are looking at milkweed density. They want to know what's happening at a particular site outdoors, uh, but there is a partner um, to this group called Monarch Joint Venture that has a lot of uh, related um, research undertakings, and I'm not sure if they are interested in, um, you know, raised monarchs and caterpillars that people are raising themselves, but the Monarch Joint Venture is a website that you could look at. Uh, let me put it in the chat, because like I said, I don't know if they're interested, but they are a partner to this Monarch, monarch Larva project, and so they may be interested. I'm just not as familiar. So let me put this in the chat for you. Um, they may have more information about, about people that are raising monarchs. So please check that out. All right. Excellent. All right. I want to thank everybody for, for, um, for collaborating on this. Um, we, we have some last minute questions. I'm, I'm gonna stop the recording. Thank you folks online for, for participating also and listening to this recording. I'm gonna stop the recording.